In the late 1700s, a lethal epidemic was wreaking havoc on the world. Its mortality rate was so high that, around that time, roughly a quarter of the entire adult population of Europe died because of it. The disease I'm referring to is called consumption, or tuberculosis. Doctors of the time were understandably desperate to investigate any potential treatments for the disease. The English chemist and physician Thomas Beddoes dedicated a significant part of his career to researching tuberculosis. Since the disease was known to affect the lungs, Beddoes was keen to investigate the medicinal effect of inhaling different gases. Now, this was cutting edge stuff since, at the time, a brand new field of research was emerging. One that was completely upending the landscape of science. The field of pneumatic chemistry. This was the study of gases, including what were known as factitious airs, meaning artificially made gases which were given off during various chemical reactions. Whenever you see effervescence during a reaction, that's a factitious air being produced. The rise of pneumatic chemistry led to many chemists trapping and investigating these gases. As a result, many new gases were identified in this era, including the independent discoveries of oxygen in the mid-1770s by the Swedish-German chemist Carl Wilhelm Schiele and by the English chemist Joseph Priestley which led to the fall of the mighty phlogiston theory of combustion that had stood its ground for well over a century before. If you want to learn more about that, I have an entire video about it, so I'll put the link in the description. Now, with all these new gases being discovered, Beddoes needed help creating some specialised apparatus for his experiments. A well-accomplished chemist and engineer in the field of pneumatics was the Scottish inventor James Watt, after whom the unit for power is named. Watt had previously invented an improved form of the steam engine, which became one of the main drivers of the Industrial Revolution. As such, he's arguably one of the single most important people in all of human history. Beddoes asked Watt to manufacture machines to produce, clean and store gases for use in research, and to build specialised breathing apparatus, all in the name of tuberculosis research. Watt, who had lost two children to the disease, agreed to help. In 1795, the two published a book together, documenting many case histories of patients who had inhaled oxygen and hydrogen gas to treat a variety of ailments. Some of the results seemed promising, so Beddoes was eager to expand his research, and in 1798, he opened the Pneumatic Institution in Bristol, hiring an aspiring young chemist called Humphrey Davy to run the lab there. Davy was just 20 years old when he started working at the institution, but he was already making a name for himself as a gifted chemist. One of the many gases that Davy investigated was nitrous oxide, which had been discovered a couple of decades earlier by Joseph Priestley, who had called it nitrous air. Priestley first produced this gas by reacting various metals with nitric acid, but only relatively small quantities had been obtained. Davy faced the challenge of producing large quantities of pure nitrous oxide for inhaling. His first few attempts resulted in mixtures of nitrous oxide with nitric oxide and nitrogen gas, which he inhaled several times himself to observe the effects. This might seem reckless, and to be honest it was, but back in the early days of chemistry, it was common practice for chemists to investigate the taste of any new chemical that had been synthesised. In old chemistry books and papers, you often see, amongst the properties of the substance, its taste, being sweet or bitter, for example. So it wasn't so crazy for Davy to inhale these gases to investigate the effects on himself. So even though Davy wasn't too bothered about protecting himself, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't protect yourself either. To help with that, today's video partner is NordVPN. NordVPN can't protect you against inhaling random gases, but they can protect you against a variety of online security threats such as malware, phishing, or so-called man-in-the-middle attacks. Imagine you connect to what looks like a safe public Wi-Fi network at a local cafe and start browsing as normal. However, for all you know, a hacker has set up that network to trick you into connecting, and as soon as you connect, they'll be able to start harvesting your sensitive data. By using NordVPN, you can browse with the knowledge that your data is safe from outside intruders. I'd actually already been using NordVPN for a couple of years before they approached me for this partnership, so I can tell you with sincerity that they're worth checking out. 
If you head over to nordvpn.com slash chemistorian, you can get an extra four months when you purchase a two year plan. That's literally the best deal out there at the moment. So if you want to beef up your online security, using my link is the best way to go about it. They even have a 30 day money back guarantee. So you may as well just check it out for a month, completely risk free at nordvpn.com slash chemistorian. It's a great deal for you guys. And as an added bonus, you'll be helping to support my channel as well. Okay, back to the video. Davy found that the impure nitrous oxide just made him feel faint and slowed his pulse. However, in April 1799, Davy managed to synthesize a large volume of pure nitrous oxide, and for over half a minute, he inhaled it from a 3 quart or 3.4 litre silk bag to see how it would differ to the impure mixture. In his book, published just over a year later, Davy documented his very first inhalation of pure nitrous oxide. He said that it made him feel giddy and described the sensation as a feeling analogous to that produced in the first stage of intoxication. He also noted that his pulse was rendered quicker and fuller. So, in essence, the impure mixture had acted as a depressant, and the pure nitrous oxide had acted as a stimulant. Davy decided he needed to do more experiments. The next day, Davy wanted to inhale the pure gas again, but this time, prior to breathing it in, he would first breathe as much air out of his lungs as he could before holding his nostrils and breathing in 4 quarts of the nitrous oxide. This time, he felt the effects even more strongly. He described a gentle pressure on all the muscles attended by a highly pleasurable thrilling. He said that the objects around me became dazzling and my hearing more acute. Towards the last inspirations, the thrilling increased the sense of muscular power became greater, and at last, an irresistible propensity to action was indulged in. I recollect but indistinctly what followed. I know that my motions were various and violent. He found that within 10 minutes, his state of mind had returned to normal. From then on, Davy became fascinated by nitrous oxide. For the next year, he inhaled it regularly, sometimes three or four times a day for a week straight, and he meticulously documented his experiences. He said, Generally, when I breathed from 6 to 7 quarts, muscular motions were produced to a certain extent. Sometimes I manifested my pleasure by stamping or laughing only. At other times, by dancing round the room and vociferating. He was so amazed by the effects of nitrous oxide that he wanted to share it with other people. He started inviting friends, colleagues and acquaintances to wild laughing gas parties, which he held in the drawing room above his lab. All in the name of science, of course. One attendant was the English poet Robert Southey, who famously wrote Goldilocks and the Three Bears. After he experienced nitrous oxide for the first time, he wrote to his brother Tom to tell him all about it. In his letter, he said, Davy has actually invented a new pleasure for which language has no name. Tom, I am sure the air in heaven must be this wonder-working gas of delight. So yeah, it sounds like Saudi was a fan. Over time, as Davy consumed more and more nitrous oxide, he got bolder with his experiments. In the winter of 1799, Davy wondered whether his stimulant gas might increase the effects of alcohol. So, two days before Christmas, he downed an entire bottle of wine within eight minutes got extremely drunk and found himself barely able to walk. He mentions in his book, I ought to observe that my usual drink is water, that I had been little accustomed to take wine or spirits, and had never been completely intoxicated but once before in the course of my life. This will account for the powerful effects of a single bottle of wine. He passed out for a couple of hours and woke up with an intense headache and nausea. But, after inhaling some nitrous oxide, he found that the headache and nausea disappeared. And, despite earlier being unable to walk, he made strides across the room and continued for some minutes much exhilarated. Three days later, on Boxing Day, Davy performed his most extreme experiment yet. In the presence of Dr. Kinglake, who also worked at the institution, Davy sealed himself in an airtight breathing box which had been designed by what? He remained in there for an hour and a quarter as various quantities of air and nitrous oxide were gradually pumped in 
and he felt the sensations that by now he was used to. However, that wasn't quite enough for Davy. As soon as he got out, he began to respire 20 quarts of unmingled nitrous oxide. He said, I existed in a world of newly connected and newly modified ideas. I theorized. I imagined that I made discoveries. Soon afterwards, when he tried to describe these discoveries to Dr. Kinglake, he exclaimed, Nothing exists but thoughts. The universe is composed of impressions, ideas, pleasures and pains. It's obviously very hard to describe your experiences while in an altered state of consciousness. Although Davy tried his best to explain how he felt during his experiments, he summed up the feeling as indescribable. Similarly, when he administered nitrous oxide to an unnamed paralytic patient and asked him how he felt, the patient said, I feel like the sound of a harp. After an entire year of regularly inhaling nitrous oxide himself, Davy had developed signs of addiction. He said in his book, A desire to breathe the gas is always awakened in me by the sight of a person breathing, or even by that of an airbag or air holder. But what about nitrous oxide's effect on tuberculosis? Well, sadly, it didn't seem to have any effect at all. However, it would go on to have another major use in medicine. One day, Davy developed a terrible toothache and found that while he was inhaling nitrous oxide, the pain completely disappeared. Davy noted in his book that since nitrous oxide is capable of destroying physical pain, it may probably be used with advantage during surgical operations. This was a major revelation because at the time, painful dental and surgical procedures were routinely performed with little anesthetic whatsoever other than perhaps an alcoholic drink. Some doctors even believed that the intense pain felt during an operation was an important part of the healing process and they refused to prescribe anything that might reduce this pain while they cut somebody open. However, despite the great potential of using nitrous oxide as an anesthetic, it wouldn't be properly followed up for another four decades. Over the next few years, word spread about nitrous oxide amongst the international scientific community, and by the 1830s, there were multiple traveling showmen who went around exhibiting laughing gas to audiences. One such showman was an 18-year-old American called Samuel Colt, who, in 1832, had had the idea for a new type of handgun with a revolving cylinder, but didn't have the finances to manufacture it. Upon hearing about the wild laughing gas parties that had become popular in England, he decided to go on tour around North America, performing laughing gas exhibitions in order to raise funds. He would gather crowds and administer nitrous oxide gas to volunteers who would pay handsomely for the chance to experience the effects. In time, he raised enough money to fund the patent and the production of the most reliable revolver ever invented which would famously become used by cowboys across the Old West. A decade later, the American chemist, Gardner Quincy Colton, also began exhibiting laughing gas to large audiences. On the 10th of December, 1844, he gave a performance in Hartford, Connecticut. Here's Colton's own recollection of that night. I gave the gas to a young man by the name of Cooley, and while under its exhilarating influence, he began to dance and jump about. He ran against some wooden settees on the stage and bruised his shins badly. As the effect of the gas passed off, he took his seat next to Dr. Wells who said to him, You must have hurt yourself. Cooley began to feel some pain then and was astonished to find his legs all bloody. He said he did not feel a particle of pain till the effects of the gas had passed off. While the audience were going out, Dr. Wells said to me, Why cannot a man have a tooth pulled while under the gas and not feel it? I replied that I did not know. Dr. Wells said he believed it could be done and would try it on himself if I would bring a bag of gas to his office. The next day, I went to his office with a bag of gas. Dr. Wells called in Dr. Riggs, a neighboring dentist, to draw his tooth. I gave the gas and Dr. Riggs took out the tooth. On recovering and finding his tooth out, Dr. Wells exclaimed, It is the greatest discovery ever made. I didn't feel it so much as the prick of a pin. That was the first tooth ever drawn without pain. This changed everything. Dr. Wells began administering laughing gas to his dental patients during dental procedures and, emboldened by his success, 
he wanted to share his discovery with the medical community. In January 1845, he travelled to Boston to arrange a demonstration of nitrous oxide at the Harvard Medical School. A couple of days after he arrived, a small announcement was published in the Boston newspaper, The Boston Bee, saying, A dentist in Hartford, Connecticut has adopted the use of nitrous oxide gas in teeth pulling. It is said that after taking this gas, the patient feels no pain. The source of this was almost certainly Wells himself, who submitted the story to the newspaper to try and build some hype around his discovery. A few days later, Wells gathered a room full of physicians and medical students. One student volunteered to have a tooth extracted under the influence of laughing gas. However, Wells removed the breathing bag before the student had inhaled a full dose of the gas, and so when Wells went to yank out the student's tooth, the student cried out in pain. One attendant said that the spectators laughed and hissed. Wells was humiliated and left the following day on the first train home. A couple of years later, he wrote, The excitement of this adventure immediately brought on an illness from which I did not recover for many months, being thus obliged to relinquish entirely my professional business. He became depressed and began abusing other recently discovered anesthetics, such as ether and chloroform. In January 1848, in New York City, he threw sulfuric acid over two women while he was under the influence of chloroform. He was arrested and committed suicide in prison. Sadly, he died completely unaware that a few weeks earlier, the Parisian Medical Society had recognized him as the inventor of anesthesia and made him an honorary member. Despite this, it took almost another 20 years before nitrous oxide was finally accepted as an anesthetic. In July 1863, Gardner Quincy Colton established the Colton Dental Association, which promoted the use of nitrous oxide as an anesthetic. Initially, Colton and his colleagues were the target of ridicule, sarcasm, and misrepresentation by the dental and medical communities who claimed that the gas had been used years before without much success. So, over the next year, Colton spent around $8,000, the equivalent of around $200,000 today, in advertising and defending nitrous oxide. His investment proved successful, and in time, laughing gas became widely acknowledged as a viable anesthetic. From then on, patients undergoing dental and surgical procedures no longer had to endure excruciating pain. Later in his life, Colton said, The gas had laid dead and forgotten as an anesthetic for 17 years when I revived it. The world is indebted to me for the gas. However, he always acknowledged that it was Wells who had been the first person to recognize its potential as an anesthetic. Colton was probably unaware of poor Humphrey Davy's contribution. To this day, nitrous oxide is still commonly used as an anesthetic in dental and medical procedures, where it's always mixed with oxygen to prevent asphyxiation. Outside of these applications, it's illegal to use recreationally in many countries, including the UK, since its inhalation has resulted in cases of brain damage and even death due to lack of oxygen to the brain. Back in those early days when Humphrey Davy was regularly experimenting with laughing gas, he couldn't have known the impact it would have on the world. One evening, while taking a moonlight walk along the River Avon, he huffed some nitrous oxide and wrote a poem about how the gas made him feel. I'll leave you with his words from that night. Not in the ideal dreams of wild desire have I beheld a rapture-wakening form. My bosom burns with no unhallowed fire, yet is my cheek with rosy blushes warm. Yet are my eyes with sparkling luster filled, yet is my mouth replete with murmuring sound, yet are my limbs with inward transport filled, and clad with newborn mightiness around. Let me know in the comments below what you'd like to see a video about next, and if you made it this far and you want to help out the channel, please consider liking and subscribing. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.